Okay, I think we'll uh, begin. Um, I'm Barry and Moore, uh, the director of the National Weather Center, and I'm delighted to welcome you to uh, the second in our series of lectures uh, dealing with uh, our solar system and our universe. This is part of Galileo's world, and we have been delighted to uh, have this association with the Bazell Library and uh, the History of Science uh, collection, and uh, in particular, our association with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, as you may remember, uh, about three weeks ago, we had Rosaline Lopez here with Dan McLeese, who was chief scientist of JPL, and Rosaline was um, our le first lecturer. But also, uh, we uh, had them tour uh, the campus and Bazell and uh, also the Radar Innovation Laboratory, which is just across the parking lot. And I said at the time in jest that uh, perhaps the, uh, the director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Charles Alachi, uh, who's a radar scientist, uh, might uh, consider doing a postdoc here when he retires. And uh, I noticed Dan McLeese looked at me a little strange. And, and what, last week I got an announcement from Charles that he is retiring. So I fired off a, an invite that he might like to come here and participate as uh, one of our postdoctoral fellows. Uh, actually, I do think that we would like to get Charles here to actually maybe give one of the lectures. And so uh, we look, can look forward to that. But tonight, we get to look forward to something really special. Uh, Dr. Linda Spilker is uh, with us. She's had a marvelous career, uh, finishing her PhD uh, as she did uh, her undergraduate work and her master's, but she finished her PhD in geophysics from UCLA. And uh, then she just took a slight trip out of town to Pasadena and Caltech at the Jet Propulsion Lab. Her early career was um, associated with one of the most exciting of missions, uh, the Voyager, Voyagers 1 and 2. And that was, uh, in some sense, the first grand tour uh, to the outer planets. And in fact, uh, Voyager 1 now has uh, uh, entered interstellar space. And uh, that was a great moment. And Voyager 2 will probably be headed that way pretty soon. But we're going to have a marvelous chance uh, because we're dealing with some, with Linda. Uh, she was there at the beginning of the Cassini mission, when it was just an idea. And then you go from an idea to building the spacecraft and the instruments and then launch and then another seven years before you get to where you want to go. And where you want to go is one of the grand places in our solar system, Saturn. So Linda, we're delighted to have you here. It's our honor. And uh, I just look forward to enjoying this immensely. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Marianne. I'm very happy to be here this evening, especially a part of OU's 125th anniversary. And that's why we have, I think, that why you have the Galileo exhibit here. Uh, I work on the Cassini mission. Uh, Cassini's been in orbit around Saturn for 11 years, uh, taking data that whole time and has made some remarkable discoveries. And I'd like to share with you some of those discoveries tonight. And there's a picture of Saturn with all of its rings visible, and this is a very special picture. Saturn is actually covering up the sun, and so you can see all of the rings in their glory in the Saturn system. Well, initially, going back a ways, the ancients knew of five planets, and Saturn was one of those planets, but those planets were only dots of light. And initially, the ancients even thought they were perhaps stars, but just wanderers amongst the stars uh, they could see in the sky. And so Galileo, uh, came along, and he actually uh, was very a mathematician, very interested in the sciences and in optics, and he built the first telescope. And here's a picture of Galileo's telescope. Uh, and his telescope at the time, it had a magnification of about 30. And if you've ever had some really good big binoculars, that's about what you can do with a pair of binoculars. But that was enough to really open up the solar system. 
and he looked at Jupiter and he found that Jupiter had four moons. He could see them as dots of light going around Jupiter, which was very interesting at the time. And then he also looked at Saturn. When he looked at Saturn, he saw the top image in 1610 and he saw what he thought were a pair of moons on either side of Saturn. And he wasn't sure why they stayed in place that they didn't orbit around like Jupiter's moons. And as he continued to watch, over the next few years, those moons, they disappeared, and he just saw Saturn. And then in 1616, he looked again, and he saw what he thought were like two arms circling Saturn. So he was very puzzled about what might be happening. And then this set of images, there's Galileo's first look at, at Jupiter, or at Saturn and, and the ring. Then Huygens is the middle one. In 1655, Huygens built a better telescope. And so he could look at Saturn, and he was the first to say that the ring, there was a ring around Saturn separate from the planet itself. And then later on, I uh, have a, a drawing here more completely uh, by um, Cassini, where he could actually, for the first time, with his even better telescope, he was at the University of Paris, he could see, at the Paris Observatory, sorry, he could actually see a gap, that dark gap in between two of Saturn's rings, and that bears his name the Cassini Division. And I had the wonderful opportunity to go up to the library earlier today and look at the Galileo exhibit up there and the wonderful books. And this is a quote that's there that was particularly striking, a quote from Galileo. And I particularly like the last sentence in which it says, it is written in the language of mathematics, meaning understanding our universe, and its characters are triangles, circles, and other geometrical figures. And so certainly very beautiful from what the work that he did in first looking at our solar system. And there are books up there, uh, first copies of many of those, very interesting exhibit. Well, Huygens and Cassini also, besides looking at Saturn's rings, play additional roles in the Saturn system. In fact, our mission, Cassini, is named after Giovanni Domenici Cassini, again because he discovered that gap that bears his name, the Cassini Division. And for Huygens, not only did he do some work with Saturn's rings, but he discovered Saturn's moon Titan. And so Cassini carried a probe right here, and we named that probe Huygens in honor of the discoverer of Titan. And so these two, two early scientists played a role in getting the names for the components of our mission. Here are two views of images of the two spacecraft. You can see the Cassini orbiter with the people next to them. The Cassini spacecraft is about the size of a two-story building. Here it's in a chamber that's it being tested like it would be in space for the illumination it would see from the sun. And there's the Huygens probe. You can see the gold thermal blanket on the probe, but underneath it, you can actually see the heat shield that was very necessary to slow down as it parachuted into Titan's atmosphere. And I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go along. And you can see people to show the scale of each of these. Next up is the Cassini spacecraft. As I said, it's about the size of a two-story building, about 22 feet tall. That high-gain antenna is 13 feet across, to give you an idea of scale. And we have a suite of 12 different science packages on board Cassini. We actually use the high-gain antenna for two of our experiments. Uh, we use it to look with the radio signals as it goes through the atmosphere of the planet or look at the rings themselves. We also use it for our radar experiments to pierce through the haze on Titan and map out Titan's surface in the same way radar was used to look at the surface of Venus. There's a cosmic dust analyzer on board where we can use it to look at the icy particles in the Saturn system and measure their composition. Have a remote sensing palette that consists of two cameras. Also has an instrument to measure in the ultraviolet, the near infrared, and the far infrared, so it can span the spectrum in looking at all of these targets to measure their composition, their heat energy, as well as get very beautiful images back. Uh, uh, we also have on board a fields and particles package, protons, electrons, ions, all of the things in situ around the spacecraft are measured by that set of instruments. You can just, in the magnetometer itself, to measure the magnetic field, Here's the edge of the Huygens probe. Cassini carried the Huygens probe to Saturn and then released it to go on to go into Titan's atmosphere. The Cassini spacecraft, you'll notice it doesn't have any solar panels. Saturn is 10 times further from the sun than the Earth, so the sunlight is 100 times fainter at Saturn. 
And so instead, Cassini has three radioisotope thermoelectric generators. You can see them down here. Basically, we take the decay of plutonium. That plutonium produces heat, and that heat is what we use to power Cassini. At launch, we had about 700 watts of power. It's been very slowly going down, but still enough to power all of the instruments. The Cassini spacecraft weighed six tons at launch, and over half of that was the fuel to slow down and go into orbit around Saturn. You can also see here we have two engines to be captured into Saturn's gravity. We had to burn an engine for 96 minutes, and we were thinking if the engine shut down, got too hot, we had a backup engine that would immediately start up and allow us to get captured into Saturn's gravity field. Otherwise, we would have just continued on past Saturn to some other target. Cassini is truly an international mission. This shows the flags of the 17 countries who provided instruments or scientists and who have participated in the mission since the instruments were selected in 1990. Uh, the Italian Space Agency provided the Huygens antenna. Uh, the European Space Agency provided the Huygens probe. And our teams are all international teams as well. This is the launch of Cassini. It was a pre-dawn launch. And we took our daughters out of school, and they were so excited. Imagine missing a week of school to go to Florida and watch a launch. How exciting. But I warned him. I said, this launch is really early in the morning, and we're going to have to get up you know, for this 4 a.m. launch and get there. And so it, we didn't launch the first day. I think we had cloudy weather. So then we got up early again the next day, and I think there was some other problem. So it took three days, and they, they weren't quite as excited <laughs> about going to see the launch after it took three days. But it was tremendously exciting. I remember seeing the Cassini spacecraft go up. It entered this cloud, and the cloud all of a sudden lit up with Cassini's engines. And we turned to each other and said, do you think it blew up? I mean, that cloud, it's just glowing. And then just a few seconds later, Cassini majestically lifts up above the cloud, <laughs> continues on its way. And you could literally feel the shaking of the rocket engines. It took several seconds to reach us, but you could feel that in your bones, just the tremendous, what a, what a wonderful start uh, for Cassini. It's launched on a Titan IV Centaur, the biggest uh, vehicle we had available at the time. Uh, but we didn't have quite enough energy to go directly from the Earth to Saturn. So if you notice, that's the path from the Earth. You can see the green, the first orbit. We had to make a flyby of Venus, speed up a little bit with the Venus flyby, onto the red orbit, uh, around for a flyby of the Earth, another flyby of Venus, finally out on the blue path, a close flyby of Jupiter. Jupiter really gave us a big boost. It's the biggest planet in our solar system. And basically, we were able to slingshot our way to Saturn. So instruments selected in 1990, launch in 1997, arrive at Saturn in 2004. If you're an outer planet scientist, you have to be patient. <laughs> it's a long wait to get there. But it, it's worth the wait, uh, without a doubt. Let me just turn that down just a little bit. <laughs> I'm going to show you next a, a movie about the Saturn orbit insertion. It was a very exciting time, and this captures the excitement. The, of course, the burn happened behind the planet. We didn't know, you know if we'd come out the other side, slowed down enough. So this is just, and I hope it won't be too loud, uh, what we experienced in going through. Uh, and why Good evening and welcome to Cassini Huygens Mission Control at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. The flight team is in place for SOI, that is Saturn Orbit Insertion, and that is when the spacecraft must be captured by Saturn's gravity or it will fly right on past the planet and the mission is over. Time to turn back around to the SOI burn attitude or pointing position and light up the rockets. It's 9.05 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. The SOI burn is approximately 92% complete. And we expect to track the Doppler now through the end of the burn. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead and go The Doppler has flattened out. Woo! Okay, we have burn complete here. Four years for this moment. Yeah. Yeah. 
That was really very wonderful. I was there with my family, my nephew. He kept saying, Aunt Linda, when are we going to know if Cassini's okay? And just a tremendously exciting moment, and to know that the mission was truly beginning with that burn. This is an outline of, of the Cassini mission. It takes Saturn 30 years to go around the sun a single time. We arrived in 2004, and NASA had given us a four-year prime mission. And then we had to go back to headquarters to ask for additional funding for the Equinox mission. Two years where we were actually able to observe the rings edge on to the sun, a very unique geometry. After that, had to go back a couple more times for our seven-year solstice mission. Uh, that mission will end at northern summer solstice at Saturn. So you can see we've been at Saturn by the end of the Cassini mission almost half a Saturn year or two seasons. Right now the Cassini spacecraft is about that position in its orbit and we have a very exciting end of the mission. That end of mission, we know the date, September 15th, 2017, uh, and we have a series of very exciting orbits prior to sending the spacecraft into Saturn that will mark the end of the mission. Right now the, the fuel light is on on Cassini. Our fuel is very, very low, and that's what's uh, uh, causing us to end the mission in 2017. Well, we have a number of science disciplines that we look at with Cassini. We've broken up into different groups. One of them is to look at the rings of Saturn and study them in great detail. Made some amazing discoveries. There's structure on the scales from many tens of kilometers down to the meter size scales that we can see and observe, and they're very beautiful. I'm a ring scientist, and they're just very beautiful. Saturn has the best rings in the solar system, as far as I'm concerned. Then the magnetosphere, that giant magnetic bubble, Saturn has a huge magnetic field that holds off the solar wind, and to study the interactions of the plasma and how the satellites and the rings interact in that system. Saturn itself, uh, you can see a view there of a huge storm that we actually caught with Cassini then a whole retinue of satellites, 16, 62 satellites circle Saturn, and uh, many of them in the inner system, some of them are captured, uh, 62 and counting. We continue to discover uh, new satellites. And then, of course, the giant moon Titan, about the size of the planet Mercury, has a thick atmosphere, the only moon in the solar system with a thick atmosphere. And so it's a target of study, and we also use gravity assist by Titan to shape our orbits. In fact, here is an example of some of those orbits. Sometimes they're in the equatorial plane of the planet. Sometimes they're highly inclined to look down at the rings and at the poles of the planet. And then we can move them around. It's like a giant cosmic dance with these orbits just by using flybys of Titan. Titan is so large, it's like having a giant extra fuel tank. And by precisely guiding our path by Titan, we can shape orbits of all different sorts. Here's a view of Saturn when we first arrived. You can see that the north polar region is in darkness. It's winter in the northern hemisphere. And the, when the Voyagers flew by, it was very close to equinox, so both hemispheres were illuminated by the sun. But in this case, with the northern hemisphere in darkness, we noticed a bluish color here in the northern hemisphere, that the hazy particles had fallen out and cleared out the atmosphere, and it looked a lot like Uranus or Neptune. You're seeing through the bluish color produced by the methane. And also you can see a view here, never, you, can, you can never see from Earth, you can actually see the shadow of Saturn on the rings behind it. The seasons are changing, and now that bluish in the northern hemisphere is transitioning to the southern hemisphere. You can see the shadow of the rings is now in the south, and that's Titan, uh, the giant moon Titan. The rings are edge on, but you can see their shadow falling in the, the shadow here, falling in the southern hemisphere of Saturn. This is one of my favorite views, the ring circle Saturn like a giant bullseye. You're looking down from the top in one of these orbits on Saturn and its rings. And you'll notice that there's an interesting place here that's still that greenish color. Uh, Saturn has something very unique in the solar system. Well, first, if you want to know how big Saturn and the rings are, there's the Earth and the Moon to scale and the distance between them. You could fit 764 Earths inside of Saturn. It's truly a giant planet. It's the second biggest planet in our solar system. So imagine if we had Saturn here close to the Earth, what a great view that would be in the night sky. If you could look up and see, we'd be circling Saturn, of course, so we'd be a moon of Saturn. Here's that giant greenish area hexagon. There's a six-sided jet stream circling at the north pole of Saturn. The only planet that has this 
Voyager discovered the six-sided jet stream in the early 1980s. Cassini comes back, it's still there. How can this jet stream be stable over several decades, much less who, know, who knows how long it's been there? So it's a very interesting puzzle. We still don't know why the hexagon is there. It's about, if you put two Earths side by side, that's about the size of the hexagon. You can see clouds circling inside it. Here's a false color view. You can see the edges now of the hexagon. And the clouds just seem to come and turn the corners. And we're not sure exactly what's going on, much less why it is so stable. So the clouds rotate at different rates on the inside. Uh, but it's a very distinct, sharp jet stream, similar to the jet stream we have here on the Earth. It just stays in place and circles Saturn. You'll notice there's a reddish spot in the middle in the northern hemisphere there, and it's a giant hurricane. This hurricane is about 20 times larger than the largest hurricane we've seen at the Earth, uh, wind speeds of over 300 miles an hour, and it too has se appears to have been stable for a very long time. There's a similar hurricane at the South Pole. In general, hurricanes tend to move toward the poles, depending on what hemisphere they're in. These are s right at the poles, so they have nowhere to go except just to stay there and rotate at very fast speeds. The sun is shining in from the right, and you can actually see the shadow of the eye wall on the hurricane here, the, the darkish shadow uh, from these clouds. This hurricane is high up above the rest of the atmosphere. Well, we saw something very special. Starting in December of 2010, we noticed a tiny white spot that marked the first storm we'd seen in the northern hemisphere. That tiny white spot quickly grew into one of the biggest storms we've ever seen on Saturn. We know these huge storms happen about once every 30 years. And so Cassini was lucky enough to be there to see the start of that storm. It's a giant upwelling. Uh, right there you can see, and then it just got sheared back. Tremendous amount of cloud cover until the tail of the storm wrapped itself back around and intersected with the head. Uh, and we had a lot, there's the, the, what we saw in looking in the near infrared, a cold upwelling core. Imagine just a giant storm like you would have on the Earth. We saw more lightning flashes in this one storm at 10 flashes per second than we had ever seen before on Saturn. So a tremendous amount of energy was being thrust up from the troposphere into the stratosphere. Just tremendous amount of energy in this storm. Probably more energy in this single storm was coming out than the rest of the energy that comes out from Saturn in, in its 30-year orbit. So here's a, a view in the visible. It's very distinct. You look in the near infrared, you can now see that the greenish color is clouds that are higher up. And, if it, and it poked through even into the stratosphere. And as it started to dissipate, left this huge, like a giant cyclops eye. Warmer temperatures than we'd ever seen in the stratosphere, creating some very interesting chemistry that we were able to watch and, and look for in the far infrared. Here's just a little, if you take and you stretch out the storm and look at it at different times. This is the storm initially. It had one vortex here. It had a second one at spawn that spun off, moving a little bit more slowly. In here, there's that vortex. There it's getting closer. And when these two vortices intersected, that marked the end of the storm. We were left with a turbulent band around Saturn. But as these two came together, it's like it took, just took the energy out of the storm and left that turbulent band, although the stratosphere continued to stay warm in the region above the storm for quite some time. So very interesting uh, dynamics in this storm. Saturn also has very beautiful aurora or northern lights. Uh, this is a, a false color view in which the colors in the near infrared have been used so that you see that you've got the blue as the two to three microns. Uh, green is a, a, a slightly different, longer wavelength, and then red is at five microns. So the reddish you see here, Saturn is dark on this side, but you can see the heat coming out from Saturn at five microns. And then the aurora flickering at the North Pole have very dramatic aurora on Saturn. One of the biggest puzzles about Saturn, you know, we thought we had solved it with Voyager, and that involved its rotation rate. There's something called Saturn kilometric radiation. It's basically a radio wave that sweeps across. Imagine a lighthouse sweeping across your eyes, and you can measure the time in between each time you see the light. We use this with the radio waves to get a period we thought marked the rotation rate of Saturn. But it turns out that when Cassini arrived, you can see that Voyager 1 and 2 measured 
a rotation period of about 10 hours, 39 minutes. It was six minutes longer when Cassini got there. So we said, no, Saturn could not have slowed down by six minutes. That's just not possible. So the source of this radiation must be elsewhere. And we think maybe it's the auroral region. But now what we don't know is we don't know the length of a day on Saturn. Saturn is mostly hydrogen and helium gas. There's no solid surface. But all the other planets, we know how fast they rotate. And so with Saturn, we're not sure. It's probably in that neighborhood. And we're hoping at the end of the mission that we'll finally be able to answer that question. And not only did the period change between Voyager and Cassini, we found that that SKR had two components that were different. What you see here is the, the frequency of that period is a function of time. So there's a different frequency here than here. They crossed about equinox. And it's a very interesting puzzle. Scientists like puzzles. And so we're still working away to figure out what might be going on uh, at Saturn. So this is one of the mysteries remaining. Moving on to Saturn's rings. Uh, the, they're the main rings of Saturn. They have very simple names, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. We're up to G uh, of the main rings. Uh, this just shows down here. Here are the main rings of Saturn, A through D. Uh, then you have Enceladus and the E ring. The G ring is in here, and the F ring is a tiny, narrow ring very close to the planet. Uh, these rings are made primarily of water ice, and they're only about 10 feet thick. Imagine a ring that spans almost from the Earth to the moon, and yet it's only 10 feet thick, really lit just literally paper-thin kind of ring. The E-ring is very extensive. It's the thickest set Enceladus, but it goes across the whole system. Very, very interesting ring. Very different, tiny little particles. Here's a wonderful color view of the rings. They're mostly water ice, but there's some component, some non-icy component, that gives them their sort of reddish, brownish color. We don't know if it's iron. Could be nanoparticles of iron. Could be silica. Could be some kind of tholins from Titan. We, there's, it's so small of an amount, we just don't know exactly what that composition is. And toward the end of the mission, we'll actually get to sample some of the ring particles, and that might help us figure out what that non-icy, kind of reddish component is. Part of it could be just micrometeoroid bombardment. Imagine that you know, the Saturn's rings are a great detector of meteor impacts, and maybe it's, the pollution is coming from that. Well, here's a, an interesting thought that perhaps, you know, the rings, if you've ever wondered where your suitcases go, perhaps they're actually lost, your lost luggage orbiting around Saturn. So instead of the billions and billions of tiny little particles, this is from a t-shirt I found. Uh, and I thought it was just very appropriate that that could be another explanation for Saturn's rings. This is, again, another top-down view, only this time the sun is shining from the bottom up. And so the rings that are brightest in the visible, in particular the B ring, is now very dark. It's thick enough that it's actually blocking the sunlight coming through. And some of the thinner rings, the Cassini division and thinner rings, actually look brighter with the sunlight trying to shine through. What I'm going to show next is a movie. If you, this is Cassini taking pictures as we're passing through the plane of the rings. This is the bright B ring, the Cassini division, the A ring. There's that, a gap in the A ring as well. You'll see a moon go by here shortly. There goes Titan. This is obviously highly speeded up. And now you get to the dark side of the rings, the side where the sunlight shines through. All of a sudden, the B ring becomes quite dark. It's basically shadowing. The sunlight's not getting through. Cassini division is very bright. There's material. There's ringlets. There's lots of material in the Cassini division. And the A ring is bright. You can just see a hint of the C ring. It's bright as well. Now, this is the view we saw at Equinox. This is with the sun edge on to the rings. And in a sense, you've turned off the sunlight on the rings. And yet, you can still see them, at least on the sunlit side of Saturn. And the only thing illuminating the rings right now is light from the planet itself. And it turns out in this mosaic, we've had to brighten up the lit side of the rings by about a factor of 30, so you could even see them, or they'd be very dark. And the un illuminated side. You can just barely see here about a, by about a factor of 60. But with the sun edge on to the rings, it gave us a chance. Now, the rings are only about 10 feet thick. So anything that sticks up above or below the rings at this time will catch sunlight and cast shadows. So we were looking to see where the rings warped, where there are other places where material was sticking up out of the rings. And I'll show you a couple of examples. 
This is that gap in the A ring. There's a tiny moon Daphnis. You can see it's much bigger than 10 feet in diameter, and it casts a nice long shadow. This tells us for the first time that the orbit of Daphnis is tipped a little bit relative to the ring plane, and so it's literally pulling material, almost like giant waves of material along the edges here. And this is material getting pulled one or two kilometers, you know, a mile or two out of the plane of the rings. This is one of my favorite pictures of this particular time. This is the edge of the B ring, the, the brightest, thickest ring. And at that edge, it's as though all of the biggest ring particles have like crowded together like cars on a freeway. And you can see them all casting shadows here. And these shadows are as much as a mile long, but lots and lots of particles that we didn't know were that big sitting right at the edge of the, of the B ring. A good analogy to that, imagine you're flying over in the space station and you want to see the pyramids in Egypt. If you look down at noon, they aren't casting a shadow and they'd be very hard to pick out because they're the same color as the, the desert background. But now imagine you fly over either, either at dawn or dusk, the equivalent of what you would see at equinox. Suddenly they would have long shadows. And with those long shadows, you'd be able to pick out the pyramids in the same way we could pick out the biggest particles here in the rings. So very powerful sort of 3D sampling of Saturn's rings. I talked about meteors hitting the rings. It turns out that they hit them, and when the rings were really dark, what happens is if you look at these bright streaks, something hits the ring, and then it spreads out, because if you're closer to Saturn, you move faster if you're a particle. If you're further away, you go more slowly, and so you just sort of twist and stretch out that impact from the meteors. And in fact, some of those, the one that's indicated with the arrows, that impactor was probably about the size of the Chelyabinsk meteor that hit in Russia. So these things do impact the rings and could be a source of their sort of reddish color. But it's just so interesting there. In each of those pictures, there's a little white streak telling us there's an impact. And they were bright because they poofed up above and could catch the sunlight. So again, equinox was a good time to look for these. This is fairly recent. We actually noticed that there appeared to be a clump of material at the outer edge of the A ring, and that clump is blown up here. And we think inside that clump is a larger particle that has slowly gathered up material from the ring, and we think we might be actually witnessing the birth of a new moon in the Saturn system. And so the scientist who found this uh, feature, he nicknamed it Peggy. Turns out it was his mother-in-law's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he thought, what a great, what a great present, you know, to, to nickname it after her. And so that name Peggy has stuck. And we think now Peggy may have broken into two pieces. One piece maybe left the ring, another piece went back in. The, the, if we can see the moon actually outside it, they'll give it a name. But it's always fun. You can always think up your own nicknames. So we're keeping an eye on what's just, what's going to happen to Peggy. Here are some of the moons in the Saturn system uh, to scale. You can see there are lots of tiny little moons that are in close to the rings. Then they get much larger. Titan is the largest. Just to show you to scale, Titan is about the size of the planet Mercury. So had it formed anywhere else in the solar system, Titan would have been a planet in its own right. And it's the only moon in the solar system with a thick, dense atmosphere. Here are just views of these very interesting, almost like shards of moons. You can see they're all the way from Methony, which it looks like an Easter egg almost, no craters, very smooth. Got a very high resolution view to these pockmarked, more ancient looking moons, to very white, sort of softened moons. This is one of my favorites. This Prometheus orbits just outside the F ring. And you can see there's a, a central moon, but it's accumulated a skirt of ring particles that it's slowly grown until it's about as large as that skirt can get, and then pieces will start to break off in the gravitational system it's bound in, but some very, very interesting moons. I just want to talk about two more of the moons in the Saturn system that are particularly interesting. This is Titan. This is the view that Voyager had. With our cameras and our instruments, all we could see was a very smog shrouded world. And so this is why we carried the Huygens probe. And so we dropped the Huygens probe off and sent it in onto Titan, and then Cassini flew overhead as we were parachuting through the atmosphere, collecting the data sent back by the Huygens probe. Here you can see the heat shield is absorbing the heat, slowing the probe down. When it's slow enough, the parachute pops out, slowly drops the heat shield, and here's the Huygens probe. 
And for two and a half hours, we took measurements about the atmosphere. We took pictures, we took all kinds of compositional data, temperatures, wind speeds, et cetera, and then landed softly on the surface of Titan. Cassini collected another half an hour of data before Cassini flew over the horizon, but there was a signal we could see from the Earth, and that went on for another three hours. So we collected some very interesting information. I'll just show you a little bit of that. Uh, one of them is that Titan turned out to be a very Earth-like world. It turns out that methane plays the role on Titan that water plays here on the Earth. You can have methane clouds, you can have methane rain, you can have methane liquid filling lakes and river channels, you can even have methane ice. Uh, so that methane has shaped and made and created this giant sea. It's about 50% larger than Lake Ontario, and it's about 160 meters deep, which is about the depth of the Great Lakes. So there's a lot of hydrocarbons on Titan. And uh, This is just a view of one of them. We found dunes at the equatorial region Long, those long, dark features, linear sand dunes. We found mountain ranges and possible evidence for cryovolcanism where liquid water mixed with ammonia would come out. You can see that there's a different color here in the composition of what's coming out of this region. We found clouds. There's an example of one of the methane clouds. We actually saw huge rainstorms on Titan that would darken the surface and then it would slowly uh, dry up with time. And then there's the Huygens probe. We actually saw these icy pebbles on the surface of Titan. We landed what we think is in a dry stream bed, and Cassini sent back, or Huygens sent back data for about another half hour, measuring directly the methane, carbon dioxide, and all of the things coming from the surface of Titan. Well, here's the lake region on Titan up here. If you added up all of the hydrocarbons in the lakes on Titan, using a depth of about 160 meters, it would be 100 times all of the oil and gas reserves we have here on the Earth. If only we could build a, a pipeline a billion miles long, <laughs> we'd be in good shape. Well, one of the questions we had is, do we know if that's liquid, for sure? And the answer came with this picture. This is taken at five microns, and this is a glint of sunlight off the surface of one of the lakes, called a specular reflection. If you've ever flown on an airplane and looked down with the, the sun shining over your shoulder, you might notice that there's a bright spot, especially if you go across a liquid body. And so this specular reflection right here let us know that yes, indeed, liquid fills, liquid methane fills these lakes. Here's the lake district, as we call our lakes and seas right here. You can see lots of tiny little lakes dot the region around uh, Titan's North Pole. They seem to be just at the North Polar region. There's one very small lake at the South Pole, but they seem to prefer whatever the, the, for the, whatever the weather is, they prefer being at the North Pole. So that was a very interesting, interesting finding. And these are all radar images, not visible images. So the radar wavelengths can pierce through the haze and the clouds and send us back these incredibly, incredibly detailed images. Here's another view of Ontario Lacus. Just uh, up close, you can see the river channels going into it. You can see what looks like very mountainous terrain, some islands. We've actually seen, uh, in looking at the same region more than once, an island that appears and then it disappears and then it reappears. And we not, we're not sure what exactly is happening with that, if it's a floating patch of material uh, that perhaps has disappeared. We're watching for the lake levels to change. We haven't seen that happen yet, but now that it's summer in the north, we're wondering, will the methane evaporate? And uh, we'll see changes in the, in the lake levels. But again, we haven't seen that happen. Now that it's winter in the south, we've noticed a giant cloud forming in the south. It's a giant vortex that, that rotates around. It's lots of complex hydrocarbons. Uh, so there's some interesting chemistry going on when you turn the sunlight off at the South Pole of Titan. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about one of Saturn's very special moons, Enceladus. Enceladus is only about 300 miles across. It could easily fit in between San Francisco and Los Angeles. It's a very intriguing moon. You can see it's very bright. It's one of the brightest moons in the solar system. You can see there are places where there aren't many craters. That tells us it must be young. And when Voyager flew by and took pictures of Enceladus, the South Pole was in darkness. So in the 1980s, we missed the fact 
that Enceladus has a series of fractures here we've nicknamed tiger stripes. And we were very intrigued about that tiger stripe region. And when we flew by the first time about 1,000 kilometers, we noticed that there's something unusual about the magnetic field as it goes into Enceladus. If Enceladus is just a frozen, airless body, the magnetic field lines from Saturn would just end at the surface. But instead, Enceladus had a comet-like appearance in the south. And so it looked to the magnetometer team like there was some kind of a cloud of material somehow hovering over the south pole of Enceladus. We flew, more, we flew, flew even closer the second time, just a few months later, and our far infrared instrument noticed that the south pole was really hot, much hotter than it should be. And we noticed in particular that the heat appeared to be coming out of those four tiger stripe fractures at the South Pole. So we had very interesting bits of evidence we're putting together until in looking closely at the images, it turns out that there are geysers coming out of the South Pole of Enceladus, so out of those fractures, maybe as many as 100 individual jets or geysers coming out of the South Pole. You can see a view of them here. Here's a slightly better view uh, coming out, spewing into space. Much of the material falls back to the surface. That's why Enceladus' surface looks so young and so bright. And some of it goes on to even form the E-ring uh, that I showed you earlier. Here's just another backlit view of some of the jets. You can really see a lot of detail here, just all spewing out into space. And these contain water, carbon dioxide, ammonia, methane, complex material, mostly water, but lots of other very, very interesting ingredients that go with it. And if you blow up one of these tiger stripes, they're about 100 miles long, a uh, couple miles across. They have these ridges on either side. You can almost see like a bright frost along this ridge, probably from material that's fallen back coming out of these geysers uh, coming from Enceladus. So just really, really intriguing, totally a surprise. We had no idea why you know, this would be going on on Enceladus. Then we knew that there had to be a liquid water reservoir. Our radio science experiments for gravity said at least there's water under the South Pole. A Little bit more analysis, we now know that it's a global ocean. So underneath Enceladus' icy crust, about 10 kilometers down, there's this liquid water ocean that surrounds the entire core of Enceladus. So very, very intriguing to find that. And that ocean probably has been there since the time that Enceladus formed. And in that ocean, we also found that there are hydrothermal vents coming out of the seafloor of Enceladus. In the E-ring, we found these tiny grains, these nanograins that could only form if you have hot water in contact with the rock on the ocean floor. Then that hot water can take the minerals out of the rock. When the hot water spurts out and hits the cold water, those nanograins of silica instantly crystallize. Then they come up out of the plume. And so we saw for the first time evidence of hydrothermal activity indicated here, and that those particles then go on out into space. And there's a good analogy here on Earth. If you look deep in the ocean seafloor, there's a, a white smokers, black smokers, hydrothermal vents, where that hot water full of minerals hits the cold water and the minerals condense out, looking almost like a smoke coming out. And around the hydrothermal vents on the Earth, you have an amazing array of biodiversity. You have anything from tiny little organisms and cells to worms to fish, all living very close to the hydrothermal vent. If you get too far away from the energy and food, then there's just a fall off. So they're like islands of life on the seafloor where no sunlight reaches. So we wonder, we have the conditions on Enceladus very similar to what we have in the Earth's oceans. We actually found salt in the ocean as well, salty seas with hydrothermal vents, could there be life in the ocean on Enceladus? Cassini doesn't have the instruments to make those measurements. We didn't know, or we might have changed what we put on the spacecraft, but we didn't know at the time. So good reason to go back someday and, and try and figure it out. Here's just an example of what we, a cartoon of what we think might be happening. Here's the ocean underneath, probably has carbon dioxide gas in it, comes up through the vent as gas and icy grains and then freezes out. Just a really, really fascinating world. Some of the tiniest particles go on to form the E-ring. And you can see here, here's Enceladus, that black dot. There's the geysers coming out. And you can see these finger-like tendrils going on out to create the E-ring. 
and that E-ring goes totally around Enceladus's orbit. Just a couple of weeks ago, we got our best look ever at the North Pole. The sun is finally shining on the North Pole, so we could turn Cassini's cameras to the North Pole. And here you can see it's a very rugged terrain. You can see that the, all of these tectonic fractures crisscross the craters. We were looking for evidence of the possibility that maybe the North Pole had been active, not only the South, but maybe the North Pole had been active in the past. Uh, we're still looking at the data and peering at it. They're clearly large. These are very large canyons and fractures here, uh, trying to sort of piece together the story of what might be happening at the North Pole of Enceladus. And here's just a, a blow-up view of what you would see uh, with those crisscrossing fractures. There's like slumping in this crater. It's very softened. These are all crater features. Here are all these fractures. Here's a much larger ridge and fracture. Very interesting, very active world, at least at one point in its history. We also know that these fractures are much younger than the age of the craters because they go right across the craters. And so those fractures formed after the craters impacted Enceladus. And just a week ago, we had our last flyby deep into the plume. It was the closest we had ever flown through the plume before. And I'll show you a little video about what we expected to find with that flyby. The flyby is geared primarily towards sampling the plume of Enceladus. We'll fly by at roughly an altitude of 30 miles, which is approximately the distance between Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. We go screaming by Enceladus at speeds in excess of 19,000 miles per hour. We're flying deep, the deepest we've ever been through this plume, and these instruments will be sensing the gases and we'll be looking at the particles that make up this plume. Cassini was never designed to look for life in the Enceladus ocean but it does have powerful instruments that can be used to look for habitability. So we're looking for the conditions suitable for life. Now Enceladus is, is a tiny moon, but it's really intriguing. It's got this plume that is shooting out from its south pole. The plume's mostly comprised of water, water ice, that gets frozen when it's ejected out into space. Most of these particles are coming from these four major fractures that we call tiger stripes. Life needs three things, right? It needs water, it needs chemistry, and it needs energy. And right now, some of these lines of evidence are telling us that Enceladus has these three things. We see some salts, but most importantly, we see organic molecules, things like methane. Uh, we also see CO2, ammonia. One of the things that Cassini can look for is molecular hydrogen. This is the smallest molecule that exists in the universe. It's two hydrogens bonded together. This molecule can tell us about things like hydrothermal activity going on in the ocean of Enceladus. And this is very important as we start to answer that ultimate question of is there really life on Enceladus? It was a very exciting time for us to think about getting these data flying so deeply through the plume. But I have to tell you, we gathered everyone from the Cassini flight team in a room and we watched for that first signal to come back and let us know Cassini was okay. Because at 19,000 miles an hour, even a tiny particle in the wrong place into one of the computers could have marked the end of the mission. So we sat there counting down the seconds until we saw that signal and then we were cheering and whew, we made it. We made it through the plume again. So we have one more flyby of Enceladus. It's in December, much more distant. We're going to make a good map of the South Pole. It's been in darkness to really get an understanding of the heat budget, how much energy is coming out of the tiger stripes. And that'll help us better understand what else is going on in the ocean. Well, I just want to end with some of, one of my favorite pictures. This is the one I started with. This is a unique picture. You can't do this very often. It's actually made of about 144 images mosaic together into this very, very glorious image. It turns out that just a very few times during the tour, has the Cassini orbit been such that the sun is actually behind Saturn? And when the sun's behind Saturn, it was for a couple of hours, we could actually make this very detailed, very beautiful mosaic. And some of the things that you can see in it, if you look carefully, you'll notice that the dark side of Saturn is illuminated. It's illuminated by ring shine. 
So here, if you were in the northern hemisphere of Saturn, you wouldn't really truly have night. You'd, you'd have light from the rings shining down on you. If you look at this ring here, this is the sunlight refracted around through the atmosphere of Saturn. And you can think of it as seeing every sunrise and sunset on Saturn at the same time. Just very beautiful in its own right. And then the E-ring is very bright here. It's made of tiny particles. If you've ever had a dusty windshield driving into the sun, you know that those tiny dust grains really make it hard to see. So they, they glow in what we call forward scatter with the sunlight shining through. And you can see the main, main rings themselves. So just a very glorious image. And not only does it have Saturn in the rings, it has something else. Turns out that in this image, there are three planets, Mars, Venus, and the Earth and the Moon. And in fact, we knew ahead of time we we're going to take this picture, this series of pictures, to create a color image of the Earth and the Moon, the Earth, that pale blue dot. And we knew ahead of time we'd spend 20 minutes doing it, and we told all the people here on the planet, go out and wave at Saturn. So how many people <laughs> waved at Saturn on that day? Yeah, there's a few people here. Yeah, so I went out. For, it was just starting to get to be night on the West Coast in California and it was dark in Europe. And so we said, go out, wave at Saturn, send us pictures of yourself waving at Saturn, send us your selfies. Now here's the picture of the Earth and the Moon. You can see Earth on the left and the Moon on the right. And send us your selfies. We had pictures of people waving, holding their babies up and waving, their dog <laughs> paws up and waving, clubs, families, multi-generations, and all of them sent us their pictures. And we knew ahead of, ahead of time what we're going to do with those pictures. And we said, OK, we're going to take those selfies and we're going to recreate this mosaic. So we did. Oh my gosh. So all the selfies that we got from all around the world were put into this mosaic. And I'll tell you, we really got a lot of hits on this as people tried to figure out, where am I <laughs> <laughs> in that picture? Because if you think about it, in that 20 minutes we were taking pictures of the Earth, People were in that picture. It's just that the Earth was only a few pixels in size. But your photons were there as you went out and waved at Saturn. So that was really, really a lot of fun to be able to do that. Well, as I said, the Cassini mission is going to be ending. We have a very exciting grand finale. Uh, we're going to do something daring and go to a place that we've never gone before. And we're going to take Cassini. We're going to take its orbit from orbiting outside the rings in a single orbit, we're going to jump across the rings and start orbiting here, right next to Saturn. And, and we think there's a narrow gap about 2,000 kilometers wide between the innermost ring and the atmosphere of Saturn. And we hope there are not too many ring particles in there to run into. We'll be going 34,000 miles an hour as we dive through that gap and we have 22 orbits planned. So if, here's an animation I'm going to show you. If you could ride along with Cassini for one of those final orbits, and it only takes about an hour to go through from one pole to the other, passing in between the rings and going back out. And as you can imagine, we're going to do this 22 times. We'll measure Saturn's gravity and magnetic fields, the mass of the rings, what great pictures of the rings and the planet we'll get during that time. In fact, I don't know if there's a Star Trek fans here, but I almost imagine it like being on the bridge of the Enterprise as you go diving down <laughs> in between the rings and coming out uh, the other side. So it should be a very great end of the mission. Then on the final orbit, we get a slight nudge from Titan, and its gravity sends us into Saturn. We do this for planetary protection. There's actually something like that we have out there. That now that we know that Enceladus has an ocean, we know Titan also has a water ocean. We want to make sure that when Cassini's fuel is spent, it doesn't accidentally run into one of these two moons. So, uh, plus, we're going to get great science in these orbits, but a very fitting end is to send it. It'll be, I say, going out with a blaze of glory in that very final orbit. So let me just show you a little movie. It sort of highlights what some of the things I've talked about and what we're going to be doing in the sol uh, rest of the solstice mission. Cassini is there in the Saturn system now, has been making discoveries for the last several years, and there's more to come. The 
By studying the satellites in the Saturnian system, we begin to understand something also about the origin of the solar system. There is strong evidence now that most of the surface of Titan is in fact covered with organic material of some kind. We're going to be looking at lakes on the surface of this moon in detail. We're going to be looking at the atmosphere to see how the climate changes over time. We have some global circulation models that tell us if the winds pick up, we think there could be waves on the lakes of liquid methane. Can you imagine anybody thinking that we would discover active cryovolcanism on one of these moons? Geysers? One of the things that we'll do in the next couple of years is make the first ever flyby through the plume when the plume output is at its maximum. And then of course there's the planet Saturn itself. As we go through our series of orbits and as the seasons change, it's like having a brand new mission. One Saturn year is nearly 30 Earth years. To be there for nearly half of a Saturn year is a once in a lifetime opportunity. The sun now is coming up on the North Pole, so we're getting to see territory that was in darkness when we first arrived in 2004. Pretty soon we'll have the whole hexagon and the hurricane inside of it illuminated by the sun. And then of course the mission's end itself is completely unique. Starting in 2016, ending in 2017, these orbits will take us up and over the north and south poles of the planet. We're actually going to dive in between the innermost edge of the D-ring and the upper atmosphere of the planet itself. From that, we're going to learn how is Saturn constructed from inside out. We'll also get the magnetic field of the planet, the mass of the rings for the very first time, and get to sample a place that no spacecraft has ever flown before. This is a mission that cannot be duplicated. So we really want to take advantage of this opportunity to observe seasonal variation in the system. Well, thank you very much.